in. I can see the attendees list um, populating at the moment. So we'll just give it a 30 seconds or so as everybody jumps in. If you're just joining us, we are here for a live webinar and Ali uh, Steen and myself, Steve Ames, are from Harbour Faith Community in Carrickfergus. I'm sure you know that. And we have with us here tonight, special guest, Aaron Burnett. Uh, I'm just channeling my inner, inner radio DJ host here, so oh, wish wow. me luck. Um, mm -hmm. Aaron, Aaron is with us today because, um, well, I, I've been fascinated with some of her work, uh, some of her blog. Um, I know she's, she's written a book, which I've started reading as well. Um, she is a thinker, a theologian, a writer, a blogger, as I've said already. And um, her journey has been fascinating. We're particularly interested in her um, conversations and her interest in ASD and faith. So basically what it means um, to live with autism as a Christian and how, how those intersections play out for her and, and more than likely for other people um, with autism. So um, we're gonna begin just with a few introductions and I'll hand over to Ali, but just before I do that, a um, bit of housekeeping. So I can see the attendee list is more or less full now. So to let you know how it works, we're going to be chatting here for about an hour and a half in total. And you can ask questions anytime. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A section. So just drop into that and type a question and it'll come up on my screen and I'll be able to see that you have a question. There's also a chat feature. Please don't put questions in the chat because I'll not see them. You can use the chat just to talk amongst yourselves. But if you want to ask a question, make sure you use the, the Q&A. Um, you can pop a question at any time but we'll only be looking at the questions from about halfway through. So Ali and I will ask Aaron questions to begin with, and then we'll start looking at the Q&As. When you put a question in the Q&A section, you'll only see your own question, so you won't be able to see other questions, but I'll be able to see them all. Allegedly, Zoom webinar is working on a feature where you can see everybody's questions and you can upvote them and so on, which will be great. But for now, you'll just see your own and we'll take it from there. Um, so, Feel free to drop in a question at any time and we'll do our best to get around to it if we can. Awesome. Uh, we are streaming live on Facebook as well, but if you're watching on Facebook, you'll not be able to ask questions or use the chat feature. If you wanna do that, make sure you go to Zoom itself and just log in as an intend attendee. Otherwise you're just watching what happens live. There will be a recording on YouTube afterwards. Um, it'll probably go live later tonight or tomorrow. So I'll hand over to Ali to get us started with some questions. Yeah. Erin, thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to meet you again, this time virtually. Um, I was wondering for the benefit of everyone watching, if you could start us off by telling us just a wee bit about yourself and um, what keeps you occupied at the moment. So my name is Erin Burnett. I'm 21. I just finished my theology degree at Union College, which is part of Queen's University in Belfast. So not a bad time to go into lockdown when I've got absolutely nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So I've just been watching a lot of Star Trek reruns and also discovering how nice South Belfast is. Like I live on the doorstep of Beaver Forest and Lovely. I've been here for 20 years and I'm only now sort of getting to explore it properly. So Amazing. it could be much worse. <laughs> yeah. Did you say you've just finished your theology degree? Yes, I think we get our results next week. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. And so that was, how long was that? A three, four year course? Three years. My goodness. Um, the, I have a related question here. I mean, not that many people study theology. And uh, I think I'm right. Did I see you writing somewhere that if you study theology, your faith will either come alive or it'll die? <laughs> is, that, is that how you found it for yourself? Or how would you describe your experience of studying theology? Yeah. I think that's definitely true because theology, if done properly, the whole idea is to study a wide variety of views, some which might make you profoundly uncomfortable, comparing and contrasting them, and ultimately that should leave you with a much better understanding of your own faith. Yes. So deconstruction is a term that's very popular at the minute, and that certainly happens at theological college. So you end up picking apart all your previous assumptions, basically knocking everything down and then building it up from scratch. I, I'm, fasc I'm fascinated by that. Can I just ask, is that, is that what they 
teach you to do? I mean, do they tell you we're going to deconstruct you or we're going to help you deconstruct your faith? Or is that just something that happened to you? I mean, were you expecting that to happen? Not really. I think especially in an environment like Union. Mm. Um, I mean, I had a very good time at Union, but it, it certainly has its own views. It's a very evangelical college. Um, so I think, I think I annoyed the professor somewhat because I went out of my way in my essays to try and find the most controversial authors I possibly could just to be annoying um, and comparing and contrasting them with some of the more reformed thinkers like the likes of Tim Keller, not necessarily valuing one over the other, but just yeah. trying to consider the breadth yeah. of information that's out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. some people seem to think that deconstruction is a threat to your faith, but I don't, I don't think it has to be at all. Um, so we're going to ask you a question about your book. First of all, I'm very impressed that when I first met you, you didn't just start with Hello, I'm Erin. I wrote a book when I was in school because that's what I would do. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could tell us a wee bit more about your book and um, some of the themes that are in it about like redemption and forgiveness. Okay, hey, uh, so... When I was at school, because I had such social difficulties, I didn't really have anyone to hang out with at lunchtime. So I wanted to find something to keep myself occupied. So I would sit in the computer suite and just type away and ended up with a book. <laughs> so it's called Liza's Avenger. It's a fantasy book for well, because it's an American publisher, they call it middle school, which is like the end of primary school, the beginning of secondary school. And I think I was very inspired by Dragon Quest. I was very into Dragon Quest. So it's the main character. Her sister is killed by a race of humanoid monsters. So she goes out in a quest for revenge. But eventually, along the way, she figures out that revenge will not bring her peace and that Forgiveness and reconciliation is the only way she can ever live her life. And I think I was trying to do kind of like what C.S. Lewis did with Narnia, but not as well. Um, so he tried to weave a Christian allegory into his story. And then a very small Christian publisher in Colorado ended up seeing some sort of potential in it. Mm -hmm. So they were really helpful in helping me edit it. Along the way though, it sort of, it became a lot less allegorical and a lot more in your face. It's a little bit preachy, but I think that's because they wanted to suit, you know, the American evangelical audience. Okay. So, yes. yes, you can, you can see that um, coming out towards, I'm about three quarters of the way through. And uh, I, I can see exactly that the, the um, the the ideology where that comes from and uh it, it fits that that narrative well you know from that american stream and um, and the story around it it's rich it's impressive actually i mean as as ali says <laughs> for doing that and well i i can relate to you in one sense because i was a bit odd in school as well and uh and i, well, I didn't relate to people very well and i didn't um i used to go and hide in the library too but i just read books on dinosaurs so so I know about Brachiosaurus and Triceratops and who, who would win in a fight between Triceratops and tri Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's come in handy in life. Well, you, you know, you, you, you mock now, Ali, but when, <laughs> when the dinosaur apocalypse comes, yep. you know, who's yep. going to be laughing at but no, yeah, so while I, whilst I disappeared into my own world of, of dinosaurs, um, you created that and it's, it's wonderful and it's a, it's a good start. Mm -hmm. And I would really encourage you to keep, keep writing. I'm sure you are already, but um, there's much more to come from you. Um, uh, did, I, as you look back on it now, would you, would, I mean, I don't want to give away spoilers or anything, but do you think you would write the, the same sort of a book? I think the main difference would be that it wouldn't be quite so Bible bashy, but okay. oh, everything else I, yeah. I, I still quite like. I, I just like fantasy books. It's nice escapism. Yeah. 
I have a little girl who I think will um, love it. So I'll definitely, and then that will fall in with home learning and then I won't feel so guilty that I'm not. You, know. <laughs> you can take that box. Um, just um, a quick one back to the theology that we talked about earlier and, and you're studying, given your experience of, of studying theology, now that you're at the other end and you've just come out of it, what advice, if any, would you give to other young people who are you know, finishing school and they're thinking about studying theology or, or maybe they left school a long time ago and they, they want to go back and study theology in a more formal way? What, what, what advice would you give to someone considering theology now? Um, first of all, go for it. It's great. Um, also, yeah, just don't be afraid to question everything. Be that annoying person in the tutorials that just questions everything because that's that's how academia happens. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think the experience will be very different depending on whether you go to like a Bible college or like a secular university. So obviously in a Bible college, your professors will be believers and the vast majority of students will be believers. Whereas in the more secular environment, your professors could well be non-believers or members of other religions. So I do think that would be more, more challenging, especially if you're coming from, you know, a Northern Irish Christian background, that could yeah. be quite a shock. But mm -hmm. ultimately it should let you understand more what you believe while also learning to respect more what other people believe. Yeah. Very, very well put. Yeah, yeah, I studied theology in uni as well. And yeah, absolutely loved it. It was great. It was a great experience. Um, you've described yourself as an autistic Christian and you have a particular interest in the experience of people with ASD and how they relate to God um, and faith communities. Um, firstly, could you explain um, what you mean by autism and its effect on, on people's everyday lives and maybe some of the language that's used around autism or you know, it, there's so many different terms. Um, so yeah, if you could kind of expand on that, that would be great. Yeah, I, I do feel like you need a translator with some of the autism jargon. <laughs> so we are autism, autism spectrum disorder, it's, it's a developmental disorder. So, I mean, I'm no neuroscientist, but the part of the brain that deals with socialization develops differently from other people. So not necessarily worse, just different. Um, the main symptoms are difficulties in communicating, having very intense interests and being quite sensitive to sound and light and all that sort of thing. Also, because it's a spectrum, there are varying levels of severity. So you have people like me who are somewhat independent, although my mum would probably question that. <laughs> and, and at the other end of the scale, you have people who are just who are mute and are completely dependent on others and there's a lot of variety in between mm. and in terms of jargon neurotypical is how we describe people who i don't want to use the word normal but that's i, I don't really know how else to phrase it but basically people who are not autistic <laughs> are neurotypical and then neuro atypical would be people like who have autism or adhd or any sort of brain pattern that's slightly different from the majority. Cool. Okay. And did you did you always suspect, or did you feel as as though you weren't necessarily neurotypical, even if you didn't have that vocabulary for it, um, right up until you received a diagnosis of your own, or was it was it a complete surprise to you? Uh, so I was eighteen when I was diagnosed. Um, I think throughout school, I always knew I was different. So I suppose the fact that I wasn't able to make friends with people at school, but I was a lot more comfortable with people who are older than me. Mm. And I was quite academically capable. And um, so I think, I don't think I ever considered that I might be autistic, but once I got the diagnosis, it was literally one of the best days of my life because everything sort of fell into place it made things make a lot of sense mm -hmm. so in hindsight i think i can look at a lot of things and think how did how did i not twig but <laughs> hindsight's a wonderful thing yeah yeah it's, it's when someone 
starts to give you language for something you've all, always mm-hmm. kind of suspected. And I mean, some, some people resist the um, diagnosis of, of ASD, I think, um, just because they find it unhelpful and other people find it really helpful, you know, to have words and, and vocabulary. So was it helpful to you to, to have an understanding of, or a better understanding perhaps of, of who you were? Definitely. I suppose I understand why some people are hesitant about labels of any kind, mm. particularly if there's still a lot of stigma around it, you know, that you might be being labeled deficit for life. But, you know, like you say, it just, it helps you understand yourself. And then it also means you can access the support services, which you need. And then, so for example, throughout university, I had a fantastic support worker it really helped me through all the ups and downs and great that's great yeah. one of the pe- people often speak about the disorder or the inabilities associated with with asd but there's of course a lot of ability as well um and and capability um in, in well in, in, at least with some people with asd and um could you talk about maybe a bit about those what what is it that um if some people with ASD actually find special expertise at or um, access. Special, special access. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so photographic memory, I think is something that quite a lot of us have and okay. that is infinitely useful at school mm-hmm. <laughs> when it comes to exams. Um, I would imagine. Also because our interests are so intense it makes us quite good at academia because, you know, if we're really interested in something, we could write papers on it for Mm. weeks. (laughs) So yeah, that sort of hyper-focus can be good. Also tend to be quite logical and analytical. So I think I read a study that most autistic people end up going into the likes of financial services, which I personally would find really boring, but I do see why our brains would be good at that sort of thing. Yes, or perhaps, um, you know, um, occupations which require singular focus, you know, um, Mm -hmm. accounting, say, or computer programming, um, things that you can go into your bubble and just focus, you know, art, even some some forms of art require Mm -hmm. exactly that to go in and and paint or write as as you've done. Um, I think that just remembering another big advantage, I think, for autism is that basically a complete disregard for social norms which I suppose could be a bad thing in some respects, but it also means... A great thing in others, yeah. Social yeah, so... Yeah, tiring. You know, I d- don't really care what people think. I just get all this stuff for better or for worse. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. And we could all definitely learn something about that, like, for sure. Yeah. And you've, you've travelled extensively. I think I read 75 countries. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's funny for, for me, looking on, I, I would think... You know, if I struggle with social interactions and I, I might be nervous about um, traveling or experiencing crowds or but you, you seem to, to cope very well and you're learning Japanese. Is that right? Or you're learning another language. Am I right about that? I was learning Japanese. You like, were, okay. I went to I went to night classes for quite a while and I even went to language school out there. But unfortunately, languages are not one of my abilities. But <laughs> it, it was fun anyway. <laughs> Um, what are, I mean, maybe you, don't, maybe you don't know this, but what are the numbers um, of people who, who live with ASD r- roughly as, a, as, a, as a, a chunk of the population? I think the latest NHS stats, they said that about 10% of adults are on the spectrum. I'm, I'm not sure what it is for children. I think it's slightly higher because people are being diagnosed more now, but with adults, it's about one in 10. Oh. But of course, there's probably so many people who just have never been diagnosed, especially in older generations when it just wasn't as much of a thing. But... Might be fun just just to ask a quick question here to the participants. So participants, if you're still with us, um, there should be a, a hand raise button that you can press. So have you ever received a um, diagnosis of ASD? If you put the hand up button, just so I, I can see as a quick spread, uh, if you raise your hand, I should be able to see you in the list, whether you consider yourself to be living with ASD. Maybe that's a very personal question to, <laughs> to ask on a public webinar. 
Yeah, okay, I'm seeing one or two hands going up there. I suppose that's about right percentage-wise. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Um, 10% is a lot higher than I would have imagined. And then when you're talking about how helpful a diagnosis was, then all the people in times gone by that haven't, you know, in generations before us that where it wasn't, diagnosis wasn't as available, it just makes me realize just how many people missed out from the benefits of that, you know? Yeah, it's quite sad. Yeah, for sure. There's even some studies about historical people um, who they're looking back at now and realizing may well have, have had mm -hmm. ASD or, or autism of some, for example, Isaac Newton. Yeah, but a lot of these sort of eccentric geniuses of time gone past were most likely autistic. I mean, you can't retrospectively diagnose people, but I'd say it's very likely. Yeah, yeah you, you can understand that now. And um, as you say, um, Aaron, when there's something you're interested in, you can write pages and pages on it and you can give it your full attention. Um, but I was listening to a conversation about how you can't decide necessarily what that is that that does capture your interest. It could be anything, but whatever that thing is. So in the case of Isaac Newton, it happened to be something that everybody was interested in. Um, mm. And so that, that, that bore, I suppose, useful stuff for, for the wider population, but he could, he could equally have been interested in, you know, Hoovers or something and just and knew everything about them, but uh, that didn't necessarily translate into, uh, into wider culture. So it's just, a, it's just interesting how those, those areas that can be given singular attention by people with autism, sometimes um, it does overlap with other people's interests and sometimes it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but it's no way of deciding what, what it is you're going to be interested in. Um, um, in terms of your faith and religion then, uh, in terms of your own Christian experience and your own Christian journey, maybe you didn't know it at the time, but as you look back now, how do you think living with autism has um, affected your experience of faith? Yeah, I, th I think it did affect in quite a profound way. So, so I always went to church growing up, um, and especially with all the traveling we did, I must have been to about every denomination under the sun, you know, whatever, wherever we were, just find the nearest English speaking congregation. So, and that was really nice because even if you're in a completely foreign place, you could find a group of very friendly people. So yes, yeah, it was always about community, but then, and the more negative side, I never really coped well with sort of Christian youth culture partially because, well, a lot of it's very loud <laughs> and yeah. also because I just wasn't very socially aware. So, yeah, I didn't really like It can be like quite as well, can't it? You know, it can be yeah. very clicky and not accommodating, you know. In words. And like, it wasn't the fault of the youth leaders or the other people. It was just the way things were. It just didn't work out. And then as I got older, started taking things a bit more seriously, read the Bible for myself. I took it all very, very literally, which in hindsight is an autistic trait. So I decided I, want to, I wanted to try and find a church that would take everything as literally as I did, <laughs> which is, um, so like if most teenagers are going to rebel, they do like sex and drugs or something, but I went to the Presbyterian church instead, and that was my great teenage rebellion. <laughs> So sorry, just just to clarify that. So you went to the you found a Free Presbyterian Church expression because that that fitted your quite literal, straightforward uh, approach to the scriptures and, and your faith. But what yeah. what, had you, what had you come from? Um, what kind of church? So let's see. I was baptized in the Presbyterian Church, and then okay. we moved to a Methodist Church simply because it was a lot closer. Um, yeah. So I came from a more mainline tradition and right. then ended up falling into fundamentalism <laughs> gotcha gotcha so but it, but it was always within that sort of more or less reformed evangelical tradition yeah sort of the northern irish usual <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um so okay so the, so you found and so did, did that work for you i mean when you yeah, as, I hear this yeah how, how did that work out i don't regret it um 
I think it's because I hadn't quite learned what nuance was. <laughs> so that's probably where the literalism came in. Um, and also in churches like that, the average age is about 70, which suited me because I liked older people. And yeah, I suppose fundamentalism, I think, appeals to people who are at a real low point in life because mm. it gives pre predictability, certainty, you feel like you're one of God's chosen people. And I mean, the people in the pews were genuinely very nice. They were really nice to me. The food was fantastic. Exactly. <laughs> and, yeah, and the sermons are certainly very academic, very, goodness, they could last like an hour. <laughs> um, yes, yes. So, but then I, I didn't really like the person it was turning me into. I was quite bigoted even towards my own family, I was just insufferable um, because it does create the mentality of I am right, you are wrong, that is that. Um, Amazing. Were... Sorry, go, go ahead there, Erin. I'm just wondering where the deconstruction then comes into that. You know, you've been talking about that with your, with your studies, but then, you know, in your Sundays, you were taking things literally. So there's obviously a journey that's went on there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to thinking back. I think actually my English teacher at school was quite an influence. I don't think he even realizes this. Um, so obviously in the tradition I was in, it was all very doctrinal and it was about believing the right things rather than being a nice person. Mm. And I remember my, my English teacher would sometimes go off and rants about, you know, Jesus and how we're supposed to care for the poor, etc. and Sermon on the Mount. And I was just thinking, what? I don't, I never hear these things in the pulpit. Like, mm. they barely ever preached in the Gospels, actually. It was almost always the letters of Paul, because mm. Paul is very, he's a great theologian. Mm. But there was never really anything about how we live now it was all about how to get into heaven when you die and i think i decided i wanted to try and find out how can i live like christ in the here and now mm -hmm. which i think started me on my deconversion and also at that point i was about to go to uni so it was a natural breaking point anyway to try and find somewhere else yeah that that is just so fascinating to listen to because <laughs> i i often wonder why is it that some young people like yourself are able to be self-reflective and realize, okay, this might be my thing, but it's not turning me into a very nice person. What is it about some people that makes them realize this, this isn't working? And for others, they just, it just seems to be a complete blind spot to them and we'll just carry on regardless, you know, and uh, I genuinely don't know the answer to that. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you think in you made you realize that, that you didn't like necessarily the person you were becoming because of all this, um, I don't know, very literalist down the line, fundamentalist type expression, which, which by the way, was also not dissimilar to my own, um, sort of 18, 19 year old and Ali's too. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to environment. So in my case, because none of the rest of my family saw things that way. Like my parents are wonderful Christians, they're lovely people. <laughs> um, so I think because there was such a big contrast in like the world of my church and then the world in which I lived in and even the like, like the scripture union at school was nowhere near that severe. So I think that sort of helped keep me grounded because I realized there was more to it than that. I think it would be a lot more difficult if you were born and raised in that bubble. That's interesting. It, it may explain why so many quite fundamentalist streams, particularly American churches, actually create whole subcultures, you know, to prevent you from experiencing the wider world and just keeping you in, in, in that culture. It, it Maybe they think they're protecting their young people from doing what you've done, which is to deconstruct and then reconstruct uh, yeah. their faith. And, you know, it's just, um, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I read your blog about autism and faith and absolutely loved it. Really beautifully written. Um, you point out in your blog that those with autism have a hard enough time relating empathetically with people they encounter every day, let alone an invisible supernatural being such as God. 
um, you then ask the excellent question, how then can an autistic person remain part of a faith community without having to force themselves into a way of thinking that is fundamentally incompatible with the way they experience the world? Well, could you say um, a bit more about that and how, yeah, how you think faith communities might be able to help, um, yeah, with removing barriers and, and, and yeah, yeah. A big yeah. question. So I wrote my final year dissertation about autistic adults in the church. Um, right. I specifically focus on adults because there's already quite a lot that's been written about children, which is great, but not so much for adults. Okay. Um, and in terms of how churches can be more accommodating, there's very easy ways that aren't controversial at all. So things like giving out earplugs or having a quiet room. What is a lot more controversial is when it gets theological. So the point I was sort of making in that article is that Christianity is at its core very relational, whether it's relationships with others or with God. Um, and I always, I really, I love that idea. I always wanted a relationship with God because the idea that the creator of the universe wants a relationship with me is a wonderful idea. The only problem is I could never quite, I couldn't even conceptualize what that would mean because, you know, I had a hard enough time forming a relationship with someone in class, let alone some sort of being I can't even see and interact with. It was, yeah, it was quite strange. And then through my research, I found there's actually loads of scientific studies by neurobiologists saying that there are actually biological reasons why autistic people struggle with the supernatural elements of faith in that our brains are just not wired that way. We're very much wired just to deal with things as they are rather than trying to think of some sort of supernatural meaning behind it. So it's not even that I'm somehow rebelling against God by not having a personal relationship with him. It's more that I physically can't mm -hmm. which is I understand why that's a really challenging idea for contemporary Christianity and in terms of what churches could do to be more welcoming they don't even necessarily have to change what they think just realizing that there are many different conceptions of what God is beyond the god of classical theism you know the being in the sky like for example paul tillich he was a german theologian and he he described god as the ground of all being mm -hmm. so that rather than god being an external being god is literally just the act of being mm -hmm. which is something i could get behind yeah or then you've also got the likes of richard Rohr, and he's very into like mystics and all that and his book the the universal christ you know he takes the idea that christ is all and christ is in all he takes that and runs with it and it's, the gist of his book is everyone is christ and again it's all about experiencing god in things that we can actually interact with mm -hmm. so yeah i think it would just be nice if churches could appreciate the variety of belief rather than forcing a very particular way of believing onto everybody when it might not suit everybody yeah yeah and i i mean i you know growing up in the 90s like the ap apologetics was such a big yeah. massive thing and just arguing and defending your belief and proving it this need to prove it there was so much emphasis put on that and um, I mean, I don't know whether that kind of like even kind of it's out of fashion now because you do hear a lot more of the Richard Roars and, and the people appreciate that. It feels very 90s to me. Um, but um, no, like I find reading that just really, really interesting because I think um, a lot of times when we think of, of, of accommodations for those with ASD, we are thinking of, you know, Little's shopping hour and the mm. light and the sensory stuff. But um, this is so much, you know, bigger. It's big concept stuff. And mm. that, that was, yeah, really, really interesting. 
Yeah, actually, I read a really interesting book for my dissertation. It's called Autism and the Church, and it's by a professor from the University of Aberdeen. And he really, he really struggles with that issue. So I think he himself, I think he's neurotypical, but he just has an interest in autism. And the issue he was struggling with was, is the Bible our absolute standard? You know, is it 100% the truth? And then what do we do when, you know, autistic understandings of God and being conflict with the Bible? And his, his conclusion basically was that, well, we're just going to have to force them to believe everything the Bible says. Um, so I love the book. Didn't quite agree with the conclusion, but I mean, the book kind of fell short, didn't it? Yeah. It's such a, that, that what you've just described is such a, f a frustrating conclusion to come to um, about the Bible. Not, not what you said, but, um, mm -hmm. and actually, it, because in a way what you're saying is, yes, it's challenging. To, to rethink God, but also hugely liberating, mm. not just for people with autism, but for just for people who, who think differently about it. I mean, I, I know for, for us, when we were told to do evangelism, we, our goal was to uh, get people to believe in God, but more than that, to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Mm. Right? That, that was the goal. So when, whenever someone said, no, no, I, I believe in God, we would say, yeah, but do you have a personal relationship with God? And, and uh, the thing is, I was a real pusher of that idea, but even I don't even know what that means now. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, a tree has a relationship with the ground, mm -hmm. okay? And that doesn't mean that it relates to it in the way that I relate to a person. It just means they're in relationship. Oh, okay, on the one hand, it's personal because that tree matters. Of course, it's, it's in the ground, but also, so it, it, it's connected to the ground of being in the same way that all trees are and and yet we insisted on telling people no no no, no. You, know, you have to have your own specific friendship relationship with God and and I know now looking back that I kind of made it up my mm -hmm. whole my whole friend buddy buddy thing with Jesus and I told Jesus my problems and it just it really actually wasn't like that although that's the those are the words I used and I should have cut myself some slack because even I struggled with it and I shouldn't have been pushing it on people to relate to God in that way. And I'm not even convinced the Bible tells people to relate to God in that way, you know? Yeah, that, it, that's hey, the most interesting thing. Yeah. Like the, er the earliest Christians were described, you know, as followers of the way, of following yeah. the way of Christ as opposed to something, you know, deeply theological and deep. It was all about your way of living, but somehow along the way it's become very feelings based. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And exactly. I think like, I mean, I've, I've been in the room and had those kind of experiences where I can see everyone getting very, very emotional on, on what's going on and things like that. I'm feeling questioning what's, what's wrong with me that I'm not, you know, I'm not, mm. I'm not getting access to this and things. So it's, it puts up a lot of barriers, I think for a lot of people. Um, I, I actually, that reminds me of a funny story. Um, I went to SISM one summer with my sister, don't know, like the children's so seaside mission. On a coming of age. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I must be missing something. You went to, to what, sorry? SISM. <laughs> so it's like a Christian well, summer scheme. We up in South Africa there. Oh, right. so, <laughs> it's like summer yeah. scheme, isn't it? It's like a church yeah. summer scheme. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So I think it was, I think I must have been like 12 or 13. So sort of in like the older end of the age range and at the end you know it was the big crescendo everyone's crying and then they're like stand up if you want to give your life to Jesus and everyone stood up except me because I was like I'm not doing it just because everyone else is doing it and my sister was like Ellen would you stand up <laughs> excellent that's fascinating because our you know churches are so they tell young people don't give in to peer pressure you know and yet that's exactly what we apply um to to young people to to uh fall in line yeah the um, raising the hands and the standing up and yeah yeah, yeah it's just a different again i also want to clarify i'm not saying that the idea of having a personal relationship with jesus is bad i think it can be a wonderful thing because it works really well for some people i I think just what I'm getting across is that that sort of language doesn't work for everyone. 
not yeah. that it's necessarily inherently bad. <laughs> yeah, and it should be noted as well that that language is, is it's not actually orthodox. You know, you, would, you wouldn't find it within orthodox Christianity or even Catholic Christianity. It, it is, it, it's a, it is a, a subset within Protestant versions of Christianity that that's emphasized. And again, not to say that's wrong, but it's just to note that if that isn't your experience or anyone's experience, then that doesn't mean you're outside. Uh, I, I would listen to an interview with a lecturer in Sweden, and uh, she was, I think, teaching uh, ph philosophy, but for some reason she was given, they had a lot of autistic students, and she was given a separate class, you know, with, with all the autistic students, and she, she remembers one of them um, who, who had a Christian background, Pentecostal Christian background, and uh, he he was obsessed with speaking in tongues or you know glossolalia to give it scientific terms and and speaking to god and god speaking to them uh, and he eventually confided in her he said you know it feels like god speaks to everyone except me because he heard so much about god told me this and god told me that but he wasn't going to pretend that he was hearing anything because he knew he wasn't you know <laughs> and he just felt marginalized and isolated by the way that everyone else around him spoke about their connection with God. And that's important, you know, that we're aware that people are often, probably more often than we realize, um, being alienated by some of this language. And it's, we need to tell them it's okay if that's not how you experience God. In fact, that, that may well be the, how the majority of people experience God. And that's, that's okay, you know. And also that um, using that language can get you further in decision making sometimes with churches and deciding over people's lives things, you know, by saying God told me to, or, you know, and there's very, there can be very little qualification sometimes of, I, I feel like maybe God's telling me, you know, there's, there's simple use of language that um, can leave room for other people who, who won't be using that kind of direct access language to also have a say and have authority, you know? Yeah. Well, on a related note then, Erin, uh, I was fascinated by your description, I think relatively recently, of yourself as religious but not spiritual. Um, I was fascinated because I always used to say the opposite. Yeah. Um, in, 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 in school, we were kind of taught to say it, you know, people would say, oh, I hear you're religious. And I always go, no. I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Now, that's because my stream was Pentecostal and spiritualism was a big part of that, you know, the healings and gifts and all that. So I didn't want to be religious. I saw that as negative, but being spiritual was positive, you know? And yet you're saying for you, it's more, the religious aspect of it is actually more appealing than the spiritualized, miraculous um, side of it. So can you explain a bit more about, about that? Yeah, so... I was deliberately flipping the saying on its head. So like yeah. you say, a lot of people are spiritual, but not religious. And I said, well, I'm the opposite in that I very much like the ritual and community of religion. So I go to church. Obviously I studied theology. I volunteer for a Christian organization. I try as much as I can to model my life on the way of Jesus. But again, just because of the way I'm wired, there's not really any spiritual component to that. It's a purely practical thing. It's kind of a hybrid of Christianity and humanism, to be honest. And I know humanism is like a swear word in some Christian circles, but yeah. Um, but interestingly, that's the way modern Jews have been doing things for a long time. So a very high percentage of modern Jews are secular Jews, meaning that, you know, Judaism, it's their culture, it's their way of life, it's very, very important, but they don't necessarily take it literally. And I think that's sort of how I relate to Christianity. Although, you know, I, I'm only beginning to explore these ideas. I'm going to do a master's in theology so I can mm. laugh around exploring theology a bit longer. So. No, I totally get it because I think a lot of people are at the beginning stages of exploring exactly that. And the more that people hear that's okay, the, the better, I think, because a, a bit like yourself, you know, I'm, I've moved more away from, from theistic views of God as in God out there. And I, I don't know that we're meant to take, a lot of the stuff is meant to be symbolic or metaphorical, and it's meant to inspire a way of living, a way of thinking, not necessarily, 
you know, curtail you into a certain narrow stream of, of thinking about God. And um, I think a lot of people need to feel that's all right. And they can still be part of faith communities and, you know, I can still be part of faith, a faith community. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of this scaffolding of religion as being something helpful to you. Um, I want to play you just a little audio clip. So this is from uh, an on being podcast. Some of you may have heard of it with Krista Tippett. And she's interviewing um, a guy. She's interviewing a guy um, whose name I, I forget. I want to say Paul Connell. I, I forget. David Connell. And uh, he had written about his experiences um, learning about autism and so on. And here, this is a two minute clip of what he said. And then I, I'm going to ask you something about it if I can remember how to do this. So here we go. Yeah, and I mean, you also, among your adventures, Paul, you went to Microsoft. Strangely enough, it was actually for my first book uh -huh. uh, that, that had come out the year before at that point uh, called Banvert's Folly, which was a book about sort of failed or forgotten inventors and artists. And uh, so they, they brought me up to just do a discussion with their employees. And uh, in the middle of all this, uh, you know, as they were inviting me up, all, all this started happening with Morgan with his diagnosis. And so I asked them, well, you know, while I'm up there, do you happen to have anyone working on autism related issues? Because I'd heard a rather a lot of uh, whisperings among people that there was a, you know, a fairly major autism community uh, in, right. in a lot of computing companies. And they said, well, yes, <laughs> we certainly do have a lot going on here in, in that regard. For me, the, the strangest moment there, uh, I, was, I was speaking, I think, primarily with the uh, what they described as the math wing of Microsoft. So you had a lot of people doing sort of theoretical mathematical work and working the algorithms and things like that. And uh, I was addressing this room, and all these people were working on their laptops as I was talking, even before I started talking. And so they were looking at the laptops rather than at you? While you were yeah, speaking? For, mm -hmm. for the entire speech. And at first I thought, wow, these are really busy people. <laughs> um, and, uh, but then I, I realized uh, from, from some of the questions that, that they were then asking that they were, in fact, listening to me. And afterwards, I, I mentioned it to someone like them. They said, well, they were watching the webcast of you. I was like 15 feet away from some of these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said, well, that's just how they prefer to interact. He was talking there how, I'm sure you heard, so how a number of these people were watching the webcast of him rather, rather than him, even though he's right in front of, of, of them. And it's this idea that for some people with autism, that um, intermediary, they're not needing to deal directly with the person in front of you, but being able to go via another channel is uh, important to them. It's how they interact. And I wonder, does the scaffolding of religious practice, the prayers, the rhythms, the incantations, perhaps hymns, all that um, useful for um, non-neurotypical people in that it gives them a way, something between them and this God out there that they can interact with or get, get to grips with rather than have to deal with this invisible um, imaginary version of God, that this is like their webcam version or their webcast version that, that they have a bit more control over. Do, do you think that's um, a fair comment and maybe that's maybe or does that do you think that applies for you yeah I think so I, for example even when I was studying so there's so many different types of theology I really despised systematic theology yeah, I no, did say. no offense to my what? professors I just <laughs> like we could sit for three hours talking about like the hypostatic union and I'm like I don't care I don't care I don't Sorry, that's a terrible thing for a theology student to say. But contrastingly, I really loved practical theology because it was always about faith and action, how we can use this ancient belief system to make a positive difference on the world. And I thought that was quite nice. So yeah, it is, it's a good way for me to mediate, I suppose, my position in the world and how I want to relate to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron, there's a couple of questions coming in on the, the Q&A here. And uh, some of them we've gone over already, but others I'm just going to fire at you. So this one from Jade, she says, uh, 
Aaron, how do you feel that living with autism has intersected with uh, or impacted upon other parts of who you are and your identity? So other than your identity as a Christian or a person of faith, um, what other parts of your life do you think living with autism has, has impacted on? Hmm. <laughs> I'd like to say everything because I suppose it colors how I see literally everything in the world. Um, Do you think there's an impact on your gender, for example? So as a, as a female um, with autism, do you think that gives you um, what, what's called intersectionality, where you're, you're dealing with perhaps two different ways of looking at the world? Yeah, definitely. I think actually there, there's, an in, there's even more interesting studies that autistic people are way more likely to identify as LGBT, not necessarily because there's higher rates, just because we don't care as much about social norms. So we just... Wow, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah, no, it's, this is, it's very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I suppose, I think that was also something I struggled a lot with when I was VP. The expectation was, you are a girl, you will get married, you will have lots of babies. And I thought that's what I wanted because it was, you know, I was told that is what I should want, but only now as I'm getting older, I'm like, that just, I can barely look after myself, let alone someone else. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think we're a lot less likely to fall into gender and sexuality norms. Mm. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that, that's really interesting. And um, especially what you said there, that the reason for that might be just because you're you're more willing just to be open about it and not care you know you, you already know you don't fit into norms in, in certain yeah. areas yeah yeah what um what what do you think of that Ali what um Aaron's just saying there yeah no I mean I think like intersectionality I think is really interesting and and I think we're all starting to learn how important it is to take into account that there are all these different ways that we we're not just dealing with the world in one direction you know I'm not I'm not just Ali who is a woman and that's mm. that encounters everything you know I'm also a single mother and you know, there's all sorts of parts of my experience that I bring you know to the table and that impacts how and I think that as church and as a faith community it, it's so important for us to have generosity in how we treat people because they are coming from so many different angles and in terms of even our use of language and stuff to have a you know inclusive language and, and an approach that you know really comes from that angle you know so yeah and this is one that I think you know it was great that when you suggested this I was like we, we haven't even touched on this you know about you know autism and and theology and how it impacts it you know and I think sometimes as Harbour we've got it all like we've got it all covered and you know we don't and um and it's great to to start to normalize this kind of learning you know that we get used to it like having to change our minds regularly and having to learn and having to accommodate is is a good muscle memory and um that we need to to use frequently so yeah yeah it, it it just reminds us all that the idea of what's normative and what isn't um, because, because so often, as I think Aaron, you were saying your experience was it, particularly within the, the free Presbyterian stream was that this just is the way it is and you need to be fixed to fit it. That there is no, no um, flexibility there. And yet it seems to be the exact opposite. Actually, we're, we're such a complex and diverse range of people, you know, and, and ASD is just one of those complexities within all of us as humans that what it means to be human is so is so diverse that one wonders is there even a center you know is there is there a norm <laughs> that you can't even and should we be trying to do that or should we all realize that we're, we're just um none of us ought to be privileged over anyone else and all different ways of experiencing god must be welcomed not just to take a box but because in doing so we all grow and we all learn um more and en engage with god better Mm, for sure yeah. yeah I was walking in the park the other day and what passed um two people signing to each other and I was just like it was just 
it's so beautiful when you see that and it's such you know when you and you go i'm missing out like, i need to learn sign language instantly because you know there's all these different ways that people commute uh, or communicate and you know when we're um we miss out when we block ourselves off from from this from different experiences to our own you know i've got a question from rachel um she's listed at question question one so i don't know if there's a two coming on the way maybe rachel we look forward to that but uh she says, I have several friends with autism. In terms of church, they sometimes do not fit in, in quotes, because of social nuances. For example, they come across as argumentative or not being charismatic uh, in the Holy Spirit sense, uh, but in sorry, not in the Holy Spirit sense, but in terms of personality, uh, or not interested in other people due to limited eye contact or whatever. What are your past and present experiences of making friends in church and how might the church family be more accommodating slash understanding um, without having to make every one in 10 come out with an autistic label on them, so to speak? So a lot in that one. Uh, do, you, do you want to tackle that one, Erin? Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, I think this is an area where having a label can be very helpful. So, for example, whenever I started at university and joined a new church and joined a new Christian union and all that, I've always been very open in saying, you know, in saying that I'm autistic very early on. So people <laughs> know what to expect, kind of. Um, in terms of making friends at church, how... I suppose they're just nice, friendly people. Um, yeah, and it's a, I suppose, as you said, in, in the Free Presbyterian Church, there were a lot of them were older. Um, mm. So maybe you, you didn't make f friends in the traditional sense of peers, but you were able to enjoy their presence, their company, in that sense, maybe? Yeah. And I think also, and not even just in church, but in life in general, people tend to bond over common interests. And I think, again, because I've done so much traveling, I find it a lot easier to make friends with like international students and immigrants just because it's always a good conversation starter. I have been to where you're from and then friendship begins. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Start. Okay. Um, pretty simple question here. Uh, Carolyn asks, Erin, what were some of the main changes in your theology that resulted from your study at Union? So I guess that's saying what, 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 what could you put your finger on specifically um, that was a significant, you used to think this way, but by the end you thought this way as a result of, of that study in terms of theology? Goodness, just about everything. You know, I started yeah. off a free Presbyterian and now I'm a very liberal Anglican. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. That's but, quite some journey. Oh yeah, in three years. Um, I think probably the single biggest change is how I view exclusivity. That's probably the biggest one in terms of, you know, I used to think my way is the highway. <laughs> Everyone else is going to hell. Um, now I think I'm more open to considering different traditions as different but equal, mm -hmm. even secular traditions like humanism and the like. I think we have more in common than what divides us. So I do think that's the biggest difference that I no longer think there is only one way to believe. <laughs> uh, or, or to not believe as well. Or to not or, believe, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's something really interesting about, you know, like the idea of non-theism instead of atheism and how, but also how sometimes atheism can kind of behave like an inverted evangelicalism where they like mm -hmm. trying to convert everybody to their atheism and it's quite aggressive but this kind of the, how you're speaking about kind of non-theism is actually quite generous and you know isn't trying to you know persuade or convert anyone as well you know which is really and nice. I, but i certainly haven't always been that nice because i almost swung from being a very fundamentalist conservative to being a fundamentalist liberal in that Say, for example, on the LGBT issue, I used to be against, against it all. And yet when I changed my mind, I would look at people who used to think the way I thought and say, oh, they're awful, horrible bigots, even though I used to be like that 
six yeah. months ago. So, yeah. yeah, I think we just need to be charitable of where everyone's at. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, there's, there's nothing like um, someone who used to be part of a, a fundamentalist group who comes out of it as the most ardent critic against that previous group. You yes, know? definitely. It always happens. Um, yeah. I, can, I can see that in myself sometimes. Um, so the reform question. smoker thing too, you know, like yeah, when we stop smoking, when we hate all smokers, that kind of thing, you know. Um, Aaron, you still okay for some more questions? Yep. Cool, cool. Uh, I've got one from Philomena here. She says, hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for your openness. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the divine feminine? So this is thinking about God, not just in masculine ways, but in feminine ways as well. Um, did this even get a mention in your course in Union? I, I doubt it, but you, also, uh, do you want to become a minister? Ah. <laughs> so those are her questions. So the Divine Feminine, did that come up in your course? Did you talk about the feminine aspects of God? And, and do you want to be a minister? Um, so I think the expected answer is no, it didn't come up at all. It's Union. Um, <laughs> we don't even have female staff members. <laughs> Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Well, they have female, there's no female permanent faculty members. There are female guest lecturers, but that's the extent of it. Gotcha. Um, are so, yeah. there many female students overall? Surprisingly, in my year, there are more girls than men, wow. but all the ministry students were men. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, so yeah, the Divine Feminine, that's actually something I haven't looked into a lot. But my master's degree is all about women and chaplaincy. So it's definitely going to come into play there. So I haven't looked into it yet, but I will. And yeah. I do think it's a very interesting area. Like, why do we always refer to God as he? If God is supposed to be some non-human entity, why is he gendered? Um, Good question. Yeah. Interesting question. Good question. <laughs> Yeah. And Among the, the female students then in, in your year, were you, you know, the only one who's kind of maybe asking those questions or is there an atmosphere of that, you know, of just curious actually to see what's maybe going beyond, behind the scenes there? Are there are there female students there who are rocking the boat a wee bit? I'm sensing no. Yes, but it's always the ones who aren't from Northern Ireland. So like... Very interesting. I don't want to say too much in case I like identify people, but I know certainly the people who were willing to question things the most were from like mainland UK. Okay. Um, I don't know if we had any particularly controversial like local people, but yeah. Mm. I have a question from anonymous attendee. Uh, some people have perhaps found online lockdown church services challenging. Uh, how have you found interacting with services remotely, if you have been, and do you think this should encourage Christian groups to reconsider how they view the purpose and or format of church in general? Well, the main way I've been doing church, as it were, is every evening I've been doing like the Anglican daily offices, um, once with St. Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh, because why not? Um, I'm hoping to move to Scotland to do my master's, so there, there is somewhat of a connection. Um, and then also the charity I work for, the Mission to Seafarers, they do Compline every evening. So I try to go to those when I can. And I really like them because it tends to be a small group. It's a set liturgy, so there's nothing wild and wacky about it. And it's also just a really nice way to get connected with people in lockdown. I did, I haven't really been able to do any of like the university Christian outreach stuff just because on some of those meetings there's like 40 people and everyone's talking over each other and it's a nightmare and even though they're lovely I can't so I much prefer the much smaller <laughs> Zoom meetings. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just going to fire another question at you here from uh someone my dad has as asperger's so um asperger's was the obviously the, the early way of speaking about or one of the early ways of speaking about asd and 
Anyway, my dad is Asperger's and I've just recently become Christian. I was not raised in a Christian family and I would love for my dad to come to faith, but those conversations are difficult to have as he is very firm in his belief. Uh, any advice? So I guess this person's just asking, how, I suppose it's a good question, you know, if, if a relative, close friend, someone you know has uh, uh, autism and you want to try and introduce them to the Christian faith, what's the, what's the most helpful way or is there a helpful way of going about doing that and having those conversations um, with someone with, with ASD or, or does it completely depend where they are on, on that spectrum? A big part of autism that I forgot to mention earlier is pathological demand avoidance, which is a very fancy way of saying we, we don't respond well to being told what to do. If oh. like, external demands are placed on us, it's very stressful and it usually just has the opposite result. So if you keep pressuring someone to do something, it's just going to completely turn them off it. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, in terms of having these conversations, there are certain Christian authors I've found that their way of thinking is more similar to mine. I don't know if this would be the case for the questioner's dad, but the likes of, say, John Shelby Spong or Richard Holloway, quite controversial authors, but they look at the Christian faith in a very logical, naturalist way. And I think authors like those would be a good introduction to Christianity for someone who is autistic. But again, that's just a personal recommendation. It might not work for everyone. <laughs> yeah, because I, I heard as well an interview with um, an autistic a Christian who was saying how for them, the fact that God's invisible or classically spoken of as being invisible, um, that was actually a, um, a benefit to them because they didn't have to try and read any expressions or body language. All those cues that can be very demanding for people with ASD to have to focus on, you know, it may come intuitively to neurotypical people, but for persons with autism, obviously there's, there's a lot more work that has to be done. And because that work wasn't having to be done, just, I suppose a bit like yourself in the early days, just knowing how it works, knowing mm. the system was a benefit to them. Uh, so if they know what God wants, I'll do it, you know, and if there's, I don't have to read any body language or interpret anything. It's more linear, more straightforward. And if that's how someone with autism is relating to God, then that's how they relate, you know, and it's, should be taken into account, I guess. Is, 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 that, is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. And I probably should have said at the very beginning, I don't speak for all autistic people at okay. all. It's a spectrum. Everyone's different. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's just, I, I guess the lesson for all of us is, as you kept, as you rightly put, is we, those of us who are involved in church leadership or uh, talking, who talk about faith often, just to be aware that there are lots of ways of thinking about faith and interacting. And we have to make sure that as many people as possible feel welcome and included because they are welcome and included. They, not just that they feel it, you know, but they, they're able to, uh, Oh, here's an interesting one that's just popped in. So <laughs> this is the question two we were waiting for from Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I like this one. Um, do you or how do you pray? It's okay if you don't want to answer that, but uh, if you'd like to give it a go. So that is a very interesting one. And it's something I've been sort of grappling with. So well, right now I have two different sorts of prayer. So I have the, the daily offices, which is like the Anglican liturgical bit. Mm -hmm. which I do with some other people. In terms of personal prayer, I don't really do intercessory prayer anymore, again, because the whole idea of asking God for something and then you either get or don't get it. Again, that requires a high deal of relationship, which I don't really have. Um, a book I found very, very helpful is Amen by Greta Vosper. And she's really controversial because she's a non-theistic minister. But basically, you can do all the aspects of Christian prayer. So adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, without necessarily having a theistic being. So, for example, adoration. I could just adore something I really like. Confession. 
I have plenty to confess. <laughs> Thanksgiving, I have plenty to be thankful for. And then in terms of supplication, instead of just saying, for example, God, please heal Mary, or please heal this person I know that's sick, I would rather think, okay, this person is hurting. Is there anything I can do to help them? So it's more thinking about, well, what can I do? Um, but yeah, I'm still working through that. <laughs> I, I like that, the way you really want to ground prayer in, in practical response. Um, some of us, we always assume that prayer is this your ethereal thing that we do. Which I Again, some people really love having a much more you know, spiritual, conversational type of prayer, which again is great if it works for you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But increasingly people are doing things like gratitude journals or mindfulness mm -hmm. and stuff. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a spectrum going on there. And I think they're all kind of, you know, that and prayer, they're all on the same kind of line of thinking, I think, a lot of the time, you know, noticing even me and the kids go for drives and we're like what what do we notice and it's kind of you know what like nature and all of that kind of thing you know but there's like is god part of that and how personal is that and you know what's going on there yeah because sometimes we assume that adoration confession all those things that we do which are parts of prayer, we think we're supposed to do them because God wants them. You know, they're for God. We confess to God or we adore God and God needs all that. Um, but what if, what if it's not? What if it's for us? And what if the object of the adoration isn't that crucial, as, as Aaron was saying, you know, uh, but that we adore and that we confess helps us become more alive, more connected, or keeps us more connected to the ground of all being, keeps us in relationship, you know? It reminds me of a verse, I've forgotten which gospel it is, but Jesus says, what was it? Man is not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath is made for man. So exactly. religion is supposed to, you know, uphold us and benefit us. It's not supposed to be an obligation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the second it becomes an obligation, something's, something's wrong, I think. Mm. Um, and the second you build an institution around that, those sets of obligations, it gets even worse, you know, and before before long we're all in a mess um quick question here this um john is pointing out i i'm pretty sure you haven't actually been to harbor um erin have you not yet sadly okay. not <laughs> yet so we can yeah. expect a visit that sounds encouraging but i'm i must warn you uh there's a part of our service called grace and peace now we're we're quite a touchy-feely uh, <laughs> i can see you freaking out already um uh congregation we're, we're, we're a bit hoggy but during grace and peace which in a high anglican church would just be passing the peace you know shaking hands or whatever uh we we tend to go a bit overboard and it's all huggy and there's hustle and bustle is that a sensory overload nightmare for people with autism who are present do we need to be more aware and actually i, I already know this is true because at least one person has told me it's their least favorite part of the service for exactly that reason it's just too overwhelming um, do you think we ought to pay more, more heed to how gregarious we are with each other? Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I hate that bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you haven't experienced our version of it, which is... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love the idea and the symbolism behind it. I think um, consent is a big thing. So I think it's, it's just as simple as, do you mind if I hug you? And if they say, I'd rather not, that's that. <laughs> Yeah, the, the more I hear that, the more th obviously I, you know, we we can be a bit. Sometimes they go like, "I'll just I'll just have my hand out," and we go, "No, no, come here," and they, we we give them a hug, and we think we're we're breaking the barrier or something. But I'm I'm not convinced. Now <laughs> that's what we're doing. I think we're just invading people's space, uh, and, we, and and we ought to do it do that better. I'm all about point, pointy fingers, grace and peace, just like you know, just like the Vulcan salute. <laughs> That's my comfort level. Yeah. You really have been watching Star Trek, Aaron? I have far too much. Oh, yeah, I think, um, uh, Ali, did you have a question there just about the, the conversations that are currently taking place in, in churches? Yeah, do you, do you feel that churches are open to talking about and improving inclusion for those um, who don't relate to faith in neurotypical ways 
Do, do you think that that's happening? Do you see evidence of that? In some regards, yes. Um, particularly around the more practical things, like a lot more churches are becoming more aware of, you know, like issues you just talked about, sensory issues in terms of the peace, sound and all that, making it a bit more physically welcoming. Load, pretty much every mainland, mainline denomination now has a document on their website about making church welcoming for autistic people, which is really encouraging to see. We, we better get one of those. <laughs> get on that. In terms of the more controversial things I've been talking about, not so much. Hmm. There, there's certainly always pockets of the church, I suppose like your church, that are willing to sort of push the boundaries and explore, explore things a bit more. But I think once you start messing with, you know, like, the doctrines of historical Christianity, I completely understand why that's just out of bounds for yes. <laughs> most churches. Yes. So you so Quakers you can... are an interesting bunch actually. There's quite a lot of Quakers don't believe in God. <laughs> yes, in, in that sort of theist, theistic sense. Yeah. Yeah, in that yeah. Yeah, I you're you're right. I think if conversations happen in churches, it's much more likely to be to do with the actual environment of the, ch the church building you know and like is it accessible rather than actually is our theology making any sense at all to to people who are non-neurotypical you know how, how do we expect them to access god in these remote ways you know and are we willing to to go um and i guess for us we we've always been willing to have those conversations not not particularly with asd persons in mind but just with people who have otherwise been mar been uh, marginalized by church or mm. or fed up, mainly just walked away. Actually, more more than marginalized, we began thinking, "Why are so many people leaving?" And we realized that a lot of them were thinking exactly what you're thinking. I just don't buy it. You know, I'm just don't. I'm not convinced by this supernatural stuff, and no one's willing to talk about it. So I'm out of here. So we thought, well, we'll talk about it. And what what you're saying is just another reason I think to to continue doing that. Yeah, and I, I don't even want people to agree with me. I just want them to respect me. That's it. <laughs> Interesting. And, and not place unnecessary demands upon your belief. You know, I, I think that's that's what a lot of us are asking for, politely. Yeah. Aaron, for a uh, for a young person, for a person in general, you've done some remarkably clear thinking about all this, and um, you are articulating it very, very well. And I, I just want to encourage you to, to keep going. Uh, I think you could help a lot of people, um, whether or not they're, they're on, they're on uh, the spectrum, but just people who are willing to challenge previous notions within theology, uh, sociology, all that stuff. Um, and it's been a genuine delight to, to talk with you. Um, really refreshing. And I'm encouraged because I, I always assumed that the... Um, the young theological students are mostly conservative fundamentalists, and maybe they are, maybe they are mostly, but hearing you and seeing some others, I think you have a friend, is it Andrew? Um, someone, he seems to be, he describes himself as a progressive Christian. I'm seeing more and more green shoots of more progressively minded young people, which is really encouraging to see, and you're one of them. Um, so I want to encourage you, but just as a closing uh, shot if you like as you look at the world the way it is now how you interact with it what what gives you hope for the future i mean you've, you're good at looking back at your past and seeing where you've come from and you you can see where you've been and maybe what changed your mind on certain things but as you look forward is there anything that gives you hope that fills you with optimism for the future i think even you know, looking at the present circumstances and this whole pandemic, it has, well, it's brought out both the best and the worst in people, but there's definitely been a real spirit of kindness and community. And ironically, even though we're locked down, it almost feels like we're more connected than ever before. Mm. And I don't know if that's the Holy Spirit or if it's just the human spirit, but whatever it is, it's very nice. And it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Amazing. 
that 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 book that you referred to, Richard Rohr's um, Uni- Universal Christ. Mm. I think it's in it. He talks about us having temporary costumes. So what the way we present to the world is a temporary costume. You know, our our, our the Christ in us is way deeper than me presenting as male or anyone being female or being on ASD or any of that stuff and disabled, so on. But um, just as you pointed out there, the uh, whether it's the Holy Spirit or the human spirit, I'm beginning to wonder, is there much of a difference, really? You know? the same, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we like, yeah, we, we like to talk about the Imago Dei being made in the image of God, but what if that's what it means, you know, <laughs> that um, we're, we're much more profoundly connected beyond our temporary costumes, the way we all present to each other. We are uh, connected underground to this ground of all being. And it's just a question of whether or not we're aware of that or, or how willing we are to become aware of that. Um, but yeah, that gives me hope too, that we do seem to be able to, or at least recently I've seen more of a connectedness between people because we've had to, had to do it. Um, you're right. Wouldn't be having this conversation right now. I don't think had we not been, uh, or certainly not yet, had we not been in this situation. Anyway, again, thank you so much, Aaron, for taking the time to chat. Um, love to see you in person sometime. We will dial down the grace and peace, um, <laughs> not just for you, but for, for all of us. And um, <laughs> seek consent where, where appropriate. I think it'll be a long time before the government are including are encouraging hugs anyway. So yeah, we'll see if we're safe. Yeah. Well, that, this is our chance to learn because I think, you know, with the, the date of churches returning coming, yes, they'll be returning in the buildings, but pr- probably not like the way we were doing it, you know, um, we'll have to change and why not, you know, things change. So anyway, um, grace and peace, uh, Aaron, keep going and, uh, lots of respect for what you're doing and, um, look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for me. And thank you for our attendees. Thanks for all yep. the questions. Sorry if we didn't get around to them, but, uh, there's always next time. Catch you soon. Bye. Bye.